All right. Uh, Robert, what do you think of this case? All right, so we have a 53-year-old male, right second, third finger tingling sensation for three weeks, clinically carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, looking at where the, uh, at the median nerve, it looks like it's edematous and thickened and, uh, yeah. Okay, here are a few more images. Yeah, uh, I mean, it almost looks like it's bifid and part of that looks like it's almost cystic in nature. Uh, there's some enhancement there as well. Mm. All right. Yeah. And then <clears throat> here's the ultrasound. Uh, See, there is a <clears throat> artery in two veins in here. Gotcha. In this area. And this was uh, someone who had a persistent median artery with aneurysmal dilation and it turned out to be thrombotic. And this just shows you how you can have uh, the nerve here with the uh, vessels on the side and nerve here with a vessel in the center all in one sheath, where you can have two basically separate nerves side by side with the artery in the middle. And uh, just another example of a th thrombosed median artery. <laughs> Jason. <laughs> All right. So looks so we have some palmar bowing of the flexor retinaculum. A bit here. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit of synovial thickening around the vessels. Here's the T2 on this low field of, scanner. Yeah, a lot of fluid or edema. So we just see right. a lot of fluid in the tendon sheath there. And you can see that on the coronal stir, all the fluid in between the different tendons. Yeah. And then this was uh, tenosynovitis. I think this was a patient with rheumatoid disease. Okay. I'm not sure what I... <laughs> okay, so this, this is, is a very old scan, one of the very first kind of low-field scans. It's a T2-weighted image. This just shows a cyst. This is the... A nerve here, and we're not really seeing the tendons well. This is what we dealt with in the very early days, and this was a ganglion cyst. And the interesting thing is that, even though you think this would be an area of high pressure, <clears throat> uh, uh, synovial cysts would probably be a better word for these because I think they come from the from the joint space here in the wrist. Uh, do tend to extend into the carpal tunnel. Uh, where they're thought to increase space and increase the overall pressure, so there m must be enough pressure in, in the uh, in the joint spaces here to to overcome whatever pressure you have in the in the uh, carpal tunnel. Here's just another example of a larger synovial cyst extending into the region of the carpal tunnel. Uh, again, uh, flattening the nerve here, producing symptoms of carpal tunnel uh, syndrome. Okay, uh, Robert. All right. Um, here I see a little bit of fluid in the carpal tunnel. Um, yeah, back there. And this is kind of focal, not really distributed along the, the course of the nerves. And this was also another synovial cyst. And here's another low field scanner in the area you see low, low signal intensity here, which is high on the low field on the T1, higher on the T2 low on the sagittal T1, and this was another uh, synovial cyst causing uh, symptoms of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. All right, looks like on the radial side of the wrist, we have a cyst there. Okay, so we're gonna see this fluid collection over here. Here are the axial images. Um, I don't know, it kind of looks like there's bone inside of that carpal tunnel. So it's high on T1-weighted image, fairly high on T2, but very similar to fat. And uh, here are the sagittal images showing 
the lesion right here. This is on a fat suppressed sequence, so vaginal fat like suppressed. Lipoma, you know. Right, okay. so that's a carpal tunnel lipoma, which uh, they're they're highly uncommon, but they're not, I guess not rare. I uh, can't see them. They can also produce increase, uh, uh, take up volume space here, produce increased pressure, and can lead to carpal tunnel syndrome. A 41 year old palpable mass on the wrist. Um, yeah, we see this bright signal in the carpal tunnel, tendon surrounding it, bright on T1 or T2. Uh, let's see. When the fat saturated, it doesn't, it's still bright. Um, could it be? A cyst, another ganglion cyst, or or no, it's bright on T1 too, so that's not. Yeah, it's, it's, it. it's bright on T1. You can see it even gets, uh, and it's again we don't have a comparison here. This is a T1 fat sat post, uh, where it's uh, where it's bright, but we don't know whether it's enhancing or not since we don't have a T1 fat sat pre. Mm. Uh, um, but this turned out to be a lipoma. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, so you just have to be a little bit careful. Uh, most lipomas will uh, will decrease in signal intensity uh, when you do fat suppression. But then again, some of it depends upon the exact kind of fat it is. Uh, some brown tumors have enough other material in them uh, where they won't suppress so much on fat suppressed images. But uh, this is another lipoma. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Robert, this is a very old study. I think it was when we first started doing wrist imaging in Santa Barbara. And this patient came in with chronic wrist pain. Uh, yeah, looking at the carpal tunnel, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, aside from the tendons, it looks like there's a lot of intermediate signal there some sort of soft tissue density. So this is a T1, this is a old fashioned T2. You can see a lot of boring on the flexor retinaculum. Uh, here's another cut, uh, the T2. This is a, a getting down closer to the, to the metatarsals. Here's the sagittal images showing, here's the region of the carpal tunnel in through here. Here are the metacarpals there going into the palm of the hand. Yeah, I mean, there's a mass-like structure there. It's kind of heterogeneous, and those have decreased signal in there. And if you go back, this this is uh, this is part of the median nerve. Yeah. Is it like a hamartoma of some sort? Yeah, it's because it's called a fibrolipomatous hamartoma. Uh, I used to say that these uh, were. Not rare, but but uncommon. But I haven't seen one of these in a couple of years. I've used to see them more frequently. There's fibrolipomatous hamartoma. Uh, I used to actually at one time I would say they're fairly common. I don't know why we uh, I saw a bunch over a couple of years, but haven't seen one in quite a while yet. Uh, but what happens? You have thickening. Yeah, you, you have a uh, uh, various different uh, tissue characteristics within it. Sometimes you can have fairly fatty characteristics that can be fairly bright on a T1 weighted images, uh, which uh, histologically is uh, uh, lipid material within it. Uh, not always do, on an MR do you see the bright signal in T1 weighted image. These obviously are not T1 weighted images, uh, but it can be very large. You, you, you can see the different fibrils going through it here. This is characteristic. And uh, what some people believe these are congenital lesions. It's uh, not thought to be neoplastic. Uh, some people believe that these may be due to chronic re re recurrent trauma and is like a Morton's neuroma, but in the wrist. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, but they can be very painful and lead to uh, a, a disability and dysfunction of, uh, of the wrist. I, I've done, done many. Um, tunnel syndrome re releases, and I've seen many uh, assistant, etc. Um, 
these are rare. And I Thanks, think they're congenital. Okay. All right, carpal tunnel post-op. So there is thickening of the retinaculum and scarring of the more superficial tissue there in the volar aspect of the wrist. Um, median nerve itself may be still enlarged. Yeah, kind of see, you need to image before it and after it and through yeah. it and so forth. Uh, so this is a patient who had a, uh, they, they cut the, the flexor retinaculum. Uh, so there are a lot of different surgical techniques. Maybe John can help us out a little bit here. Uh, I knew some surgeons that would just go in and basically percutaneously just incise the, uh, uh, the, the retinaculum. And uh, I know one surgeon who sometimes would do up to 20 in a daytime. Uh, so they can be done very rapidly. Uh, the problem with doing that is that they, they tend to scar back down again. And sometimes you can get mass effect and retraction of the scar, as we'll see in a little bit, which can actually over time increase the symptoms again. Uh, so when you evaluate these patients postoperatively, this is a typical kind of scarring you get in the subcutaneous tissue after these surgeries. And then you look for whether the, the flexor retinaculum is contiguous or not. And as often it will be, sometimes it won't. And then uh, try, try to check to see uh, uh, the median nerve. Again, this is a low field scanner, so uh, we don't get a lot of detail when it comes to the nerve itself. I think nowadays uh, arthroscopic releases are the most common. Um, okay, good. So, some are done uh, a little too carelessly and uh, uh, there are injuries to that uh, nerve to the thinner muscles, but uh, that's not very common anymore. Uh, it shouldn't be, but uh, that nerve can be in places where it's not supposed to be right. uh, anatomically. So that's what you have to worry about. And the, the people that do them on blind, uh, they, they're, uh, uh, I don't have much use for surgeons that do anything blind. Uh, they, they don't turn out too good. Thanks, so, John. Anyway, if, if these people are not uh, workman's comp, of, uh, I'll use the word phonies, um, uh, they, they, using uh, uh, a proper procedure will take care of the problem. Now, another way of treating this is uh, injection of uh, um, cortisone of one kind or another. And uh, uh, sometimes that works out very well, especially in acute situations where you have synovial um, inflammation of some kind. Uh, that, that, that may work out, e even in gout. Uh, uh, that happens, and, and um, if you use uh, something to decrease the swelling, uh, you, you can get by without surgery. So surgery is not really the first thing you do. Uh, that's the last thing you do. Thanks, John. Oh, this is the same study? No, this is that. Oh, did you do the last one? Yes, yeah, sir. Sorry about that. So carpal tunnel post-op, uh, we see a defect in the flexor retinaculum. Yeah. And a little superficial, this linear signal, is that um, part of the flexor or I, I something else? I don't think so. So, yeah, it just shows a partial resection of the retinaculum. Okay. Okay. Uh, Here's another case where they had prior surgery, and you can see they resected the retinaculum, but now we're, we're just getting a lot of thickened scarring and indistinctness. And then it's what you're going to start seeing is that the scar sometimes can attach to the nerve and then start retracting, and you start getting irregular contours to the nerve, uh, which in some or original papers uh, was a poor prognosis, but I'm not sure if that's held up over time. Uh, there are many uh, complications that occur, and uh, uh, you don't do these uh, 
procedures uh, without some thought. Uh, it's a procedure that you should try everything before uh, doing the cutting. Thanks, John. And here's a much more extensive re uh, resection of the retinaculum in this particular patient. And there you can see the median nerve with the fascicles in it. Okay. Uh, uh, Robert. All right. So we have a follow-up post-op. Uh, looks like there's been a carpal tunnel release uh, or a section of that flexor retinaculum there. Right. A little bit. Uh, that looks more than a release, uh, does that, John? Right. You know, there, 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 all kinds of procedures have been tried. So, but you can, I can bet you that uh, uh, all of them have problems. Yeah. Yeah. So here we can see that the uh, extensive uh, removal of the flexor retinaculum, what's left is a little bit thickened. We're kind of seeing indistinctness of the tissues here with a lot of scarring, indistinctness of the median nerve. Uh, probably because of scarring around it. So this was on 10-21-04. And then the uh, patient came back uh, uh, quite a few months later, uh, over a half a year later, and this is what it looked like. And now it looks like the flexor retinaculum is back, so some scar tissue there. Right. So, so here you can see there's extensive resection uh, but then uh, uh, in less than a year, it, it, you, you come back with an irregular thickened uh, flexor retinaculum and maybe a little edema within the median nerve here. That procedure is not recommended. Okay. Jason? All right. This is post-op imaging. Yeah, I think the kind of heterogeneous t1 and t2 signal band around the where the flexor retinaculum used to be is all scar okay. and yeah the median nerve looks edematous and the margins seem irregular right yeah so this is a lot of scarring you can see the irregularity of the surface of the median nerve this patient did have recurrent symptoms uh, suggested that the scar may be adhering to the to the nerve. Okay, uh, Elior. Okay, what MRI measurement is most reliably associated with post-op symptoms? T2 hyperintense median nerve, enlarged median nerve, or flattened ratio of the median nerve? Um, I think B, enlargement of the median nerve. Uh, well, that's that's been described. T2 hyperintensity has been described as well, but in this particular patient, it was actually the flattening that uh, mostly correlated with uh, recurrent symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people now try to get the ratio between the, the cross-sectional area or the, the thickness of the nerve proximal in the middle and distal to the flexor retinaculum. And we already talked about uh, ratios that were associated with uh, abnormalities on those. Okay, and next let's talk a little bit about the pisiform uh, triquetral complex. So over here we can see the pisiform bone here, the triquetrum behind it. <clears throat> and as you know, the flexor carpial naris tendon comes uh, uh, volarly here and uh, actually attaches in a fibrous connection to the uh, pisiform. And the pisiform has other fibrous components that stabilize it. And the uh, uh, one is uh, co continuity of the uh, flexor uh, carpial naris uh, uh, tendon fibers, which tend to go over here. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, ulnar to the flexor retinaculum and attach here uh, distally uh, to the hook of the hamate. You also has a, have a piece of forum metacarpal ligament, which is part of the capsule, uh, then a 
ulnar-sided uh, capsular thickening here, and then the flexor retinaculum also comes over here and attaches to the uh, hook of the hamate and the pisiform. And then there's the adductor digiti minimi tendon, which comes down and attaches to the pisiform in, in this location. Here's another look at it where you see the flexor retinaculum here, hook of the hamate, the uh, pisiform hamate ligament, the flexor carpial naris ligament, uh, and the uh, pisiform metacarpal ligament, and the adductor digiti minimi. Looking here, we can see the this would be the uh, uh, pisiform hamate ligament here, flexor carpi ulnaris uh, uh, tendon here, which basically goes and is mostly contiguous with the pisiform metacarpal ligament in that location. Pisiform, that's the metacarpal base. And uh, I think we talked a little bit about abnormalities of the pisiform triquetral uh, articulation in uh, previous lectures. In this particular case, the, tri the cortex, the articular surface of the triquetrum and the articular surface of the pisiform should be parallel to one another. In a situation like this, uh, this is abnormal and is usually associated with an injury to the pisiform uh, metacarpal ligament or the, the pisiform hamate ligament uh, distally. Uh, as we can see here. And those are the two smallest bones in the wrist. Pisiform is the smallest and triquetrum is the second. Thanks, John. Good. And then if you remember, we also, you frequently can get effusions in this uh, joint space. And then occasionally, if you have more tearing of these, of these distal uh, ligaments, uh, you can get proximal retraction of the piece of form from the flexor carpial naris tendon. Let's see who's next. I think it's me. Okay, go for it, Robert. All right, so here, looking at the wrist, uh, bowler aspect, uh, looks like there's discontinuity of the tendon, which I think is the FCU, given its attachment. So this is probably the flexor carpial naris. That's the piece of form. And then we can see uh, kind of a balled up increased signal intensity structure here distally here. And that's right where the marker is. Uh, here, uh, here we can see more proximally. And if we go more distally, we're seeing, uh, okay, here. So, yeah. so you're, you're talking about this. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I was uh, looking in the wrong spot here, uh, forgetting this. But you're right. Yeah. This is a complete tear of the flexor carpial naris tendon. Good. Good pickup. I. Uh, yeah. You can see it there as well. Okay. All right. Painful mass after basketball. So these slices are a little bit more proximal. Uh, I do see some edema within that flexor carpi uh, ulnaris muscle. Right. That's true. I think the tendon looks okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The uh, another one of the many structures around this location is Guillen's canal, of which there are several components. Uh, if we go proximally, we're in the area of the inlet. And then if we go more distally, uh, we, uh, there, there is a separation of the canal uh, into uh, two uh, distal components. And uh, 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 we're really here at the hook of the hamate. So... So here are the, this is the artery, uh, the, uh, the veins and the nerve, uh, flexor carpial naris muscle and tendon located here. And then we got the, uh, the flexor tendons uh, 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 of the, of the uh, uh, phalanges uh, uh, deeper. And then we're, we're getting down here where 
we're getting close to where there's going to be a separation uh, where the uh, uh, muscle comes over and attaches to the uh, hook of the hamate, uh, which then divides distally uh, the Guillain's canal into a deep uh, section and a superficial section. And there is bifurcation of the artery here with a deep and a superficial component as well as a deep and superficial nerve. At the hook of the hamate, uh, we can see the, the deep uh, area here uh, and the superficial area uh, up here. And this, this is the artery, uh, that's the, the nerve, and then these are uh, uh, veins. Uh, if we look at it differently, we can see the, uh, the ulnar nerve uh, comes down through here on the ulnar aspect, the radial aspect over here. Uh, here's the pisiform bone there. Uh, the hamate is a deep structure in through here. And then you've got the uh, uh, ulnar artery coming down here, uh, the median nerve. Uh, comes here centrally. And you can see that there's actually, as far as the vessels goes, there is kind of a ring here distally uh, in this location. But this is the area of Gans Canal over here on the ulnar side. Okay. Pathology in this area. Okay, so palm mass on the ulnar side of the volar wrist. This, uh, yeah, this structure there. Mm. Okay, I mean, you have vessels, you've got nerves. It's okay, got so this... we're a little distal here. Okay. And this is right in the palm of the hand, but it's over on that side. Here's the hook of the hamate. So we're just a little bit distal to uh, mm -hmm. Guillain's canal in this particular case. Uh, but uh, what do you think this structure is? Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you a little history. This, this is a person who's had developing increased pain and tenderness in this location and can actually feel throbbing occasionally. And uh, the patient is... Uh, as a 64-year-old carpenter. So throbbing, that would make me think vascular. Um, okay. Maybe a thrombosed. Yeah, so this is a thing called hypothenar hammer syndrome. And it actually is caused by repetitive trauma uh, to, the, uh, to the artery, just typically distal to uh, uh, to Guillain's Canal. It's due to repetitive trauma, and it's commonly seen in old-fashioned carpenters who actually used hammers to drive nails with, and also jackhammer uh, uh, operators. So it was very much dependent upon the occupation that the patient was in. Okay. Robert. All right. Here looking kind of proximal aspect of the wrist, uh, there's a, I guess, oblong mass it looks like it's a t1 intermediate heterogeneous and then bright on the uh, pd fat set imaging yeah so this is a little bit on the opposite side of uh of uh Gans canal right that's so a proximal um yeah this one looks bright internally and then intermediate signal peripherally um, now notice how the appearance Proximally and distally. Uh, yeah, it looks and like then, it tapers off at both ends. Uh, yeah. The other mean? thing, if you look here, this is kind of a characteristic uh, appearance of this lesion. It's a low field T1 weighted image with this kind of smudgy appearance in the middle. Wow. Uh, is it a, uh, I guess, a nerve lesion like a schwannoma or something? Yeah, so this is an ulnar nerve schwannoma. I can look very similar. This, you know, you could have an aneurysm uh, that looks like this. And the thing is that this isn't the location where you have the repetitive trauma. The hypothenar uh, hammer syndrome, if this were distal to Guillain's canal, that's the area where you typically get the repetitive trauma. 
and I would be uh, more concerned about being an arterial lesion, a pseudoaneurysm. This is proximal, where you really shouldn't get that kind of repetitive trauma, and this was a schwannoma. All right, so looks like there's some edematous structure in Guillain's canal there, deep to the flexor carpial ulnaris. See, it's a flexor carpial ulnaris. There, the flexor tendons. You're right. This is this is right in kind of the the entrance to uh, to Guillain's canal. Here, are the coronal images showing extending in through Guillain's canal. Okay. Um, I guess it could be the nerve, the ulnar nerve. Could be a nerve. It doesn't have the that same kind of characteristic appearance of a schwannoma like we had here. And again, uh, this this proximal and distal aspect of this lesion is classic for schwannoma. It's almost pathognomonic. You can see kind of the normal tendon, go I mean, the normal muscle going into the the mass, going into a distal normal. Uh, uh, nerve. Uh, uh, here, uh, we have, we can't really see a nice discrete mass, uh, and this also has some inhomogeneous signal, and this turned out to be a hemangioma uh, going through Gans mm -hmm. Canal. Okay. Okay, on the axial on the top left, I see. Uh, I was looking on the radial side, but I think we're. There's like edema around that, yeah, around that flexor carpi radialis. Radialis, yeah, right. And is that it? Satina synovitis. Yeah, good. So okay. that was flexor carpi radialis, Satina synovitis. Robert? Robert? Yeah. Uh, again, it looks like there's fluid surrounding that tendon, which I think is also the FCR in this fluid case. Surrounding uh, what? The, uh, the tendon of the uh, Robert, FCR. Are you still with us? Uh, yeah. Tell me. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear us, Robert? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can okay. hear you. We can hear you now. We had that okay. problem again. Go ahead. All right. So it looks like there's fluid again surrounding the FCR. So I think that's tenus synovitis again. Yeah, the flexor carpi radialis. Good. All right. Proximal. Wouldn't it be a little more smudgy? That's kind of a unusual synovitis. Uh, I, I mean, I'm an orthopedic surgeon talking, so. Yeah. Uh, it, it depends upon whether it's primarily fluid or primarily synovial thickening. In this case, this uh -huh. is, I think that we see some synovial thickening here with not completely fluid signal intensity. We can see a little bit through here, but this is mostly fluid. Uh, and uh, it also depends a lot upon the exact uh, MR tech imaging techniques. These are T2 fat sat images, which I don't really like because I think it's too black and white contrast. It's harder to see the, uh, the gray signal intensity that you would expect to see in synovial thickening. So we don't typically do T2 fat sat images. We do PD fat sat images where we get much more of a grayscale, and I think it's easier to uh, evaluate the kind of structures that are inside these if you uh, don't have strong T2 weighting. But this also my, gives my better contrast, first, so some people like it. <clears throat> Excuse me. My first thought was a uh, cyst. I, I, that's... 
Yeah, well, it's fluid is within the tendon sheath here, uh, which yeah. puts it in the category of tenosynovitis. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So, I'm sure there's some trace fluid surrounding that uh, flexor carvey radialis. Right, flexor carvey radialis, maybe a little bit of signal intensity within it. If we go a little bit more distal, it looks like this. Okay, much more uh, increased the in sagittal signal. sagittal images, it looks like this. All right, looks like it's transected. So we see a lot of increased signal intensity within it going across through there. And uh, yeah, this was torn and retracted. Good. I would think there's syn synovial tissue there. Okay, so the yeah, yeah, there there is uh, there is synovial tissue here along the, the 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 tendon sheath, but the tendon was torn and retracted back to here. Yeah. A 70-year-old female pain and numbness one week after injury on golf swing. Mm. I'm not sure. Do we not? Do we Yeah, the flexor carpi radialis, I think, is missing. Okay, has there been yeah, a tear of the tendon? Yeah. The traction? Things it's torn and retracted back to here. Mm. Yep. Good. Robert. All right, so let's see. It looks like uh, approximately there's a thickened tendon there and some surrounding fluid. Uh, so some tendinosis and distally, look, I don't see the tendon at all, so I think it's torn. Yeah, and here you can see flexor carpi radialis is torn, retracted back to here, and this is the end of the retracted tendon with fluid in the tendon sheath. Yep. Good. Oh, but this was extra colossus like Sorry about that. Snake, but like worms. Yeah, so I've got to go back. I wasn't paying attention here. There's a flexor carpi radialis. This is the flexor pollicis. Guess we better. Uh... Okay. Uh... All right. Not sure. I see. Oh, maybe a little of a edema in that. Yeah. Muscle there. Yeah, so that was a tear of the pulmonary interosseous muscle, one of the pulmonary interosseous muscles. Good. Okay, edema surrounding the uh, flexor in the C. Yeah. Tenosynovitis. Good. So tenosynovitis. I forgot the cause of this. I think this was uh, psoriatic arthritis, but I'm not 100% sure. Robert. All right. Here, kind of in, adjacent to the first metacarpal, is a lot of fluid and edema. I don't see a definite tendon there. So there's another yeah. tear. Yeah. Good. Muscle tear. Okay. Hey, so what was the so now instead of the diagnosis, point. we want to know what the symptoms are. Because I don't. Hmm. Inability to bend, ring, and fifth fingers. So we're missing the flexor tendons, yeah. So we're missing the fourth and fifth flexor tendons. Uh, so if I was to guess, I would say it's 
it's an injury. Yeah. Okay. Causing pain. Uh, present complaint would be pain. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think their comp complaint was that they couldn't flex their fourth and fifth digits. And uh, the fourth and fifth flexor tendons are missing over here. Yeah. And, oh. and in here. And then here, when we get farther out, we can uh, start saying, uh, well, that looks like, yeah. The question asks only for what is the complaint. So right. the complaint is pain. Well, I think the, the the complaint of the patient was they couldn't bend their ring and fifth fingers. And the problem was that they had tears of the flexor tendons. I, I understand, John. I'm just kind of yeah. pulling around here. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about the flexor tendons. The anatomy is a little bit more complicated when it comes to the flexor tendons. And if we go down to the digit, uh, you can see that there are two flexor tendons, uh, one the flexor digitorum profundus and the other the flexor digitorum superficialis. And uh, they're named really based upon their position in the palm of the hand, uh, where the superficialis is uh, superficial or more volar, more closer to the subcutaneous tissues than the profunda, which is a deeper structure. But after you get past the uh, metacarpal phalangeal joint, uh, <clears throat> well, you can see that uh, the flexor digitorum profundus extends uh, through. There's actually a separation of the fibers of the superficialis. The digitorum goes through that separation. Uh, the, the digitorum then extends distally to attach to the distal phalanx. And the superficialis goes on uh, either side of the profunda, comes back together and attaches uh, to the proximal base of the middle phalanx. And that, that allows you then to have control over uh, the different bones within the finger, uh, <clears throat> uh, even though it's a pretty complicated nature. And then you can see that the tendon uh, attachments here where they get both the stability as well as uh, vascularity uh, going into these uh, men, uh, vincula. vincula. Uh, now, one area uh, that's uh, a little bit complex is the metacarpophalangeal joint. And here we can see that you have the collateral ligaments to stabilize the joint itself, the sagittal band that we talked about uh, before stabilizing the extensor tendon. Uh, then you have the volar plate, uh, which is thickened uh, fibrous tissue that attaches to the base of the uh, proximal phalanx. It's usually thickened because you've got a lot of stresses and strains over that proximal uh, flexion because that's where you get force, your gripping strength within the the uh, the hand, very important for function. Uh, that attaches more proximally here to the uh, cortex of the volar of the uh, Palmer aspect of the uh, diaphysis here. And this the is in the metacarpal, thank you. And then here we can see that structure here, the, the volar plate, and here the flexor tendons uh, superficial to the volar plate. Uh, <clears throat> if we look at the MCP joint in the axial plane, we can see the uh, collateral ligaments on either side stabilizing the extensor tendons and then the complex uh, flexor tendons here. And this is a cross-section uh, anatomical slice. And then here would be the uh, uh, similar MR examination showing the different structures uh, with the, uh, uh, the volar plate and the flexor tendon, and the extensor tendon, and the collateral ligaments. Okay, let's see who's next. Uh, okay, so here, lower aspect of the uh, MCP joint, we see, I think, a tear of the volar plate, approximately. Okay, right. So 
And what, what we're seeing here, here's the boulder plate. It's not uncommon to get a little ossicle in the boulder plate, which is what we're seeing here. But we should be able to see continuity of the boulder plate attachment to the metacarpal cortex here, uh, which we don't see. And this is a proximal tear <laughs> due to a hyperextension injury. Robert? All right. Here it looks like another volar plate tear approximately. Okay. Some retraction there. Yeah. Good. Okay, uh, Jason? Well, it looks like this injury is at the distal insertion. Yeah. The I got the answer there. <laughs> yeah. What's going on here? Yeah, so here you can see a uh, avulsion of the boulder plate from the uh, uh, proximal phalanx, and this is associated with uh, instability in this patient, as you can you can see on other images. From uh, 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 Clavero's article in Radiographics. Okay. Okay, twenty-three-year-old ulnar deviation after trauma, the MCP joint. Uh, looks like the collateral ligament is torn proximally. Yeah. Okay. And then here on the axial images, we can see the area of the tear over here with some bone injury associated with it. And they actually did surgery on this particular case. This is a tear of the radio collateral ligament. Okay. Robert? All right. So this is a 52-year-old male with pain along the radio aspect of the little finger after subacute trauma. And here it looks like there's a retracted tear of the radio collateral ligament. Yeah. And yep. I showed the retracted part of the collateral ligament. Okay. And then here we can see an injury to the uh, muscle attachment. I'm Dr. Menemy. Thank you, John. Uh, Dr. Digiti Menemy. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Looks like the radial collateral ligament of this thumb is a uh, edematous with the maybe a traction cyst injury there. Yeah, the cyst there. And in this particular case, we can also see that there's a little tear of the bullet plate, and this was a hyperextension injury where you got an impaction injury to the bone and a traction tear of the bullet plate. And here's a little fracture dislocation with evidence of the bone injury. Okay, so you get that fifth MCP joint radial collateral ligament. Looks like it's torn distally. Right. Okay, so now this is on 6.16.03. Okay, and then this is now on 10.29.04. Yeah, it looks thick end and continuity. Looks like yeah. it's healed. So if we go back here, we can see that there's no displacement. We don't see any tissue uh, coming here, separating the collateral ligament from the bony attachment. So just like uh, in, the, in the thumb, this would be a non stinners type lesion, and it tends to scar and heal quite nicely. Robert. All right. So we have a 29-year-old professional hockey player with three months of third MCP injury. And it looks like there's some, again, a retracted tear of the right side. So I think it's that the ulnar collateral ligament. I guess I can't really tell. I can't. I can't tell. I've forgotten. Let me see if other images we have here. Here we can see it in the axial plane and some bone injury there. 
and sagittally we can see the bone injury and mm -hmm. maybe some uh, partial tearing here of the of the proximal molar plate and that was uh kind of lots of tear this was also treated conservatively okay taste All right pain on the radial side fifth mtp joint so yeah it looks like the um Radial collateral ligament is torn proximally at the fifth MTP, MCP. Yeah, it may be torn here and retracted. Yeah. And then here we can again see the injury in through here. So I just placed radial collateral ligament tear. There was some debate. It was decided to do surgery in this particular case. There they went into and did surgery and uh, attacked the. Uh, a little bit of retracted tendon uh, to the bone using a small suture anchor. And then here's uh, pre-repair, and then here's the post-repair, I mean, through there. And uh, it, it actually took quite a long time for this to become asymptomatic. It took almost four months before uh, she felt comfortable It's a well-known local basketball player. Mm -hmm. All right, so the, uh, okay, Let's see edema around that fifth digit, um, some fluid there. Okay, not sure. So I mean, here we can see the displaced tendon here, or the ligament, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so radial collateral ligament tear. Is yeah, right so it's the fifth. And again, the first and the fifth are the most common because they can get caught. Uh, the, all the others are kind of protected by the by the digits on either side. It was recommended here. Here you could see that the tear here displaced a little bit. It's recommended that this patient have surgery, <clears throat> but the patient decided to treat it on his own and buddy taped his finger to the fourth. Uh, and here you can see the, the tear not going all the way to the bone. And uh, he also had a boulder plate injury uh, here as well. Uh, 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 but he, he did fine and uh, decided, decided to not have surgery. Okay. Uh, um, how did it turn out? Yeah, he actually the next year. Do we know how it, it turned out? Well, he, he actually played for a while with his fifth finger buddy taped to the fourth. <clears throat> but I guess if you got a lot of talent, you could do that. Uh, say, Robert. So we have fifth MCP pain after injury, and we have an arthrogram here, and it looks like oh, there's tough. leakage or contrast off that radial side. So I'd be concerned about a lateral ligament tear. Yeah, Robert. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Sorry about that. No worries. So what do you think is happening here? All right, so we have a fifth MCP pain after injury, arthrogram. Uh, contrast is, you know, leaking out of the joint capsule, so I'd be concerned about a collateral ligament tear there. Yeah, and this is what the MR scan looked like. Yeah. You can see the yep. here. And that was a radial collateral tear. Okay, why don't we stop here? And we'll move over to the thumb uh, on Thursday. Okay. Thank you. Well, have a good Wednesday on tonight. See you guys on Thursday. Thanks, John. Great. Thank you. Yep.